What's up, everybody? Welcome to Church Online. My name is Joey, and I have the privilege of being the lead pastor right here at the Block Church. We're thrilled you're with us, and you're in for a great message today. We are in a series called Ask Me a Question, preaching this week and next week. Next week, closing the series, talking about how to hear from God. You need to be here next week to hear that. But as I think about today's message... It reminds me of how much I miss certain things in the COVID season. I miss you. I miss preaching in front of you and seeing so many of you and hugging so many of you, but I also miss sports a lot. And I'm telling you right now, if they cancel football season, I think that's my COVID breaking point. I might gather a militia and start to march. Just kidding, don't be mad at me, but I do miss sports, I miss football. And when I think about sports, I think about two kinds of people. Uh, There is the fanatics, the followers, and there are the bandwagon fans. For instance, do you remember when the Philadelphia Eagles won the Super Bowl? I do, basically the greatest moment of my life. And uh, there were a lot of people who came out of the woodwork and started fanning on the Eagles. And I'm like, listen, If you didn't know who the fourth string left tackle was on the 1994 team, then I don't want to hear you rooting for my team. You know, there's a difference between fanatic followers and bandwagon fans. Bandwagon fans attach to those who are winning, attach to crowds. When it's popular, fanatics, followers, they're there in the good and the bad in the struggle, in the process. They love their team and they love who they're following. And that's really the question I want to ponder today because the reality is, is following Jesus isn't always popular because it's a lot of losing before you experience any winning. And I put losing in parentheses because we certainly win, but there's a lot of earthly things that we detach from before we experience the great victories that we have. In fact, I would say that the true essence of a Jesus follower is not about how much I hold on to or acquire or gain, but more about how much I'm willing to release and let go. See, with bandwagon fans, they attach to winners. The crowd gathers when there's success. But when it's silent and still, when there's not a lot of winning, when you're detaching, when you're going through a process, that's really when the true fans, the true followers, the true fanatics show up. And to prove my point in regards to what I just said about following Jesus isn't popular because sometimes we lose before we win, look at what Jesus writes in Matthew chapter 10, verse 39. He says this, he says, For whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. It's upside down. It's when winning is losing. It's losing first to win later. And so that's the question that I'm going to answer today, am I really a follower of Jesus? That's what I want to ponder. That's what I want you to ponder. Am I really a follower of Jesus? Because the reality is, is if you call yourself a Christian to gain something alone, you're just a bandwagon fan. But if you call yourself a Christian to give something then I believe you're a follower of his plan. And this could be a challenging message, one in which you're going to need to listen to multiple times, one in which you're going to need to share and tag friends and invite others to join because my job and my role as a pastor is not to develop and gather crowds alone. My my job is to lead you to follow Jesus, which I believe is the greatest journey and opportunity of your life. But let me be clear, it doesn't come without some losing before you experience some of the winning. I want to go to Matthew chapter 19 today because I believe that this scripture really illuminates what we're getting at. And the Bible says this, and someone came to him and said, teacher, essentially, what essentially good thing should I do to obtain eternal life? That is eternal salvation and the Messiah's kingdom. So this is the question, this individual who's wealthy, who has stuff, power, influence, says, 
Teacher, what, what do I got to do? What good thing, focus on that good thing, should I do to obtain eternal life in your kingdom? And I think what the scriptures right off the bat in that verse are illuminating is this, is that eternal life or heaven is not based on what you do. It's based on who you know. It's not about works. It's based on who we know. I had a friend, I had a buddy who played in the NFL. And during that time, I was living in, a, this, in the same city. And it was amazing the kind of access I had to some places that I would have not had access to without our relationship. I mean, stayed in the nicest hotel in the city and ate at some of the nicest places and met some of the most famous people. It was unbelievable. And I didn't do anything to gain that access other than know him and be his friend. And I want to be very clear about something because there is a lot of confusion about how eternity and how life after death happens. Some people, some of you, maybe you're watching right now, are under the assumption that if you're a good person and do good things, then you experience eternal life. But your eternity and your favor with God is not about how good you are. It's really if you know him, if you're following him. And Jesus answers that question in Matthew 19. And he says this, why are you asking me about what is essentially good? There's only one who is good, but if you wish to enter into eternal life, keep the commandments. He said, Jesus, which commandments? And he says, okay, don't commit murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. Don't have false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. And by the way, that is unselfishly seeking the best or higher good for others. By the way, that's what loving your neighbor is. And the young man said to him, okay, well, I've kept all these things from my youth. And then he says this, this is important. He says, but what do I still lack? What do I still lack? And I think what the scriptures are illuminating to us is that being good isn't good enough to get you close to God. Being good and doing good is a result of the God DNA inside of us and a response that God saves us. And from my salvation, I then produce good fruit. But being good and doing good will always come up short. It doesn't get us close to God. Following him, knowing him, loving him, seeking him, not just doing good stuff, because we'll miss the mark. At some point, we'll covet. At some point, we'll be jealous. At some point, we'll fail. At some point, we'll sin. We'll break the law. But do we and have we received the grace and the mercy of God? Which is why Ephesians 2.8 says this, that God saved you by his grace when you believed. When you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for good things we've done. So none of us can boast about it. It's very clear, friends, that there's not enough good that you can do to get you God's favor. So there's not enough good that you can do to get God's grace. It's simply believing and following that we experience his eternal life. So Jesus goes on in Matthew 19, and then he answers him again. And he goes, listen, young man, with lots of money and lots of influence, if you wish to be perfect, that, to, that means having the spiritual maturity that accompanies godly character with no moral or ethical deficiencies, which we all have, by the way. Go and sell. Here's the key. Go and sell what you have and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. It's losing now, winning later. And then Jesus says, come follow me. Be my disciple. Trust in me and walk the same path that I walk. But when the young man heard this, he left grieving and distressed for he owned much property and had many possessions. Look at the brackets, which he treasured more than his relationship with God. Jesus said to his disciples, guys, I assure you, and most solemnly say to you, it is difficult for a rich man who clings to possessions and status as security to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, for it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man who places his faith in his wealth and status to enter 
the kingdom of God. So, so look at me for a moment, lean in, because I know that you're probably thinking to yourself, man, if he would have just sold everything he had, he could have followed God. But it's a little bit easier written and easier said than done. I, I think you would agree. I mean, this was a big moment, and it's why he turned and walked away. Because he valued what he gained. He valued what he had. He valued security and safety and his identity. He valued his wealth more than his obedience and his love and his desire for God. It was hard for him to trade his success here on earth for his success later in heaven. He was a fan of the idea. He was a fan of the winning of the crowds But when it came to truly following, he couldn't swallow the pain or the release of what it would take to follow Jesus. So the question today, how do I know I'm a follower of Jesus? And I want you to look at this. My possessions and status don't have a hold on me. Rather, my personal relationship with Jesus is what holds me together. Come on, somebody. You should be saying amen and putting that in the chat right now. And I want to read it again. Let's focus on this. How do I know that I'm a follower of Jesus? Well, it's not all the good I do and all the stuff I did and all the things I gain. It's that my possessions and status don't have a hold on me. Rather, it's my personal relationship with Jesus that holds me together. It's my knowing and my loving and my following of Jesus. How are you doing with this? Do you have possessions that are holding you? And it might not only be money. I I think in this scenario, in the scriptures, God is illuminating finances and wealth and money and status. and, and, And that's fine. And that might be something that is a challenge for you. But there are other things that plague some of us in our journey with God. And so I wanna just take the time I have left and I wanna maybe show you some common possessions that sometimes have a hold on us. So I want to give you three today. Here, here's the first one. Here are some common possessions that have a hold on us. Uh, first and foremost, I think our identity, my identity sometimes has a hold on us. And, and I think that this is one of the greatest battles of our generation, our identity, our status, I think sometimes we choose political affiliation over the gospel. I think sometimes we choose our tribe, our group, our friend circle, sometimes even our race over the gospel. I think some of us, we lean into our wealth or the idea or the poverty identity that we have over the gospel. And sometimes these attitudes and these mindsets They supersede our gospel presence and our gospel pursuit in our life. I think sometimes career over the gospel or even our physical body and the desire to be in control of what we say is ours, our own body, when it's his, even our sexual identity at times, it can be our choice over the gospel, my identity, who I am, the status I have, the wealth I have, the things I have, the career I have, the hopes I have, and sometimes we choose that over the gospel. But Galatians 2.20 says this. This is Paul writing. He says, my old self. Somebody write in the chat right now. My old self. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That changes everything. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, I used to have an identity of one way. I used to have ideas of one way. I used to have a standard of one way, but Jesus came in and he changed everything. And now I follow him and my identity is in him first and everything else second. In his book, Seeing Jesus from the East, Ravi Zacharias, uh, who's a world-renowned apologist and of Indian descent, he writes about receiving Jesus in the Indian culture. He says, in the East, when you receive Jesus, basically you're writing your social and sometimes your physical death. Why? Because essentially, if you are not 
the religion of your family, you will be written off as crazy and as someone who doesn't fit. In the West, particularly in the United States, and maybe you're watching from another part in the world, but for those of us who live in the United States, we compartmentalize our Christianity, and sometimes we even keep our faith quiet because we don't want to offend. But he was saying that moving from Hindu to Christian might completely expel him from family and friends. Much like what Jesus said when he said, to follow me means even denying your mother and your father, which is an Eastern perspective. But Ravi says this, and I think this is powerful. He says, I am not an Indian who happens to be Christian. No, rather, I am a Christian who happens to be Indian. In other words, his identity in Christ, it's not that he's denying his culture, and it's not that he is colorblind in any way, shape, or form. He appreciates, respects, and he's honoring his culture, but what he's saying is Christ and my commitment to following Jesus, my identity and my bloodline as a believer is first. Everything else is next. And I think there are too many of us who are fans of Jesus and the idea of him as opposed to a true follower. We have too many worldviews that we're committed to too many political allegiances, commitments to our own identities, our tribe, our ideas. And and listen to this. Whether they win or lose, followers go where the leader leads. On the contrary, conditional supporters follow only until the leader loses or if the leader does something that they don't like. And the question is, is which one are you? Are you a conditional follower? A conditional fan with God when you need him? Or when you want something? Or are you really a follower of Jesus? Are you really a follower? And and I think one of the possessions sometimes that keeps us is our identity. Here's, Here's the second possession I think sometimes that keeps us. It's our comfort. It's our comfort. And I want to be clear, I'm extremely, extremely comforted in following Jesus. I am not, however, always comfortable. Those are two different things. In my sickness, I'm comforted. In in my sadness, I'm comforted. In my confusion, I'm comforted. In my pain, I'm comforted. In my loneliness, I'm comforted. In, in, In loss, I'm comforted. We have great comfort in Jesus. But I want to define comfort for a moment, okay? Here's what it is. It's the state of physical or emotional ease. It's the lack of pain, constraint, or limitation of preference. Mark 8, 34 says this. It says, then calling the crowd to join the disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way your own identity, right? Your own comforts. Take up your cross and follow me. See, this is a personal call to personal possessions, your own personal comforts. Your cross might be different than someone else's. However, God is looking for the same sacrifice, not necessarily the same amount or the same release. So I say all that to say this, that Being comforted is different than being comfortable. And sometimes God calls us to a greater level of discomfort because he's trying to get us somewhere that leads to greater winning and victory. One of our values at the Block Church, by the way, we say this, we say we're always multiplying. We embrace mission over preference. We are devoted to inviting others to Christ. We're devoted to making disciples and reproducing churches. And as COVID ends, we're going to continue to multiply and start new locations. But I believe we're multiplying even now being online. But the point is, as we say the line, we embrace mission over preference. And in our journey with God, that often is the case where we are embracing mission. God, your mission, your purpose, your desires over our preferences. And let me tell you when discomfort or lack of comfort is actually healthy. When I'm not meeting my potential, I'm a little bit uh, uncomfortable, and that's healthy. When I'm in sin, I'm thankful for discomfort. And when I'm making a decision outside of God's best for my life, 
I'm thankful that I'm uncomfortable. When God is speaking to me about something or someone that needs to go and be out of my life, I'm thankful for that sort of discomfort. When I'm giving sacrificially, when I'm releasing my control financially, that's uncomfortable, but it's right. When I'm not treating someone biblically, I'm made uncomfortable by the Spirit. When God is asking me to do something that I don't necessarily prefer to do, but I hear his still small voice, I'm uncomfortable, but it's for my benefit. The, the, the point I'm making is, is sometimes my possession is my comfort, but my comfort is the enemy to my victory that's on the way. But I've got to lose before I win. Am I really following Jesus? Because if I'm committed to my identity and my comfort over the cross, then maybe I'm just a bandwagon fan and not really a follower. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says this. I love this. Paul goes, for our momentary, momentary, think about that, our light distress, this passing trouble is producing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, surpassing all comparisons, a transcendent splendor and an endless blessedness. I think that's beautiful. And in our discomforts, our momentary and light distress is actually leading to something so glorious and so wonderful. All right, as I close, here's the last possession that I think sometimes keeps us from fully following Jesus. And I think it's our dreams and our goals. Sometimes our dreams and our goals are in the way. And I'm, I'm not gonna lie that this pandemic has been frustrating, but it's been nice in some ways. It's forced us to slow down and some have actually embraced it. Some of that hustle culture and keeping up with everyone else has faced some impossibility. It's, it's been hard to do that. But rest assured, this will, this will end. The COVID crisis will end and our pursuit of goals, dreams, and happiness will resume. And I want to be very clear about something. Listen to me. Look at me. It's okay to have goals and dreams. It's important. It's necessary. It's not bad. But all accomplishments of goals lead to desiring to accomplish another goal. And I want you to understand that while you have dreams and goals, they may not and almost never bring the complete fulfillment that we're looking for. And I want to make a statement that's very important. You need to grasp this and understand it. It is, it is, it is the most important thing for you to walk away from with today. As a Christian, your ultimate goal is to know, love, and obey Jesus. Anything short of this is failure. Anything or anyone that receives more than him is idolatry. It means you're not following. You're a fan when there's a crowd. As a Christian, guys, look at me, hear me. As a Christian, your ultimate goal is to know, it's to love, and it's to obey Jesus, no matter how challenging, painful, or difficult, no matter who's got to go or what has to go. Anything short of this is failure. Anything or anyone that receives more than him is idolatry. Your dreams are important. Your goals are necessary. But if they contradict the scriptures, what God says about you or to you, or if they impede his purpose for your life, they will come up short of satisfaction. And Mark 8, 36 says this, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? And as I close this message today, I'd love for you to lean in with me for a moment. Are you pursuing gaining the whole world, but willing to lose your soul? Are you a bandwagon fan when it's easy or comfortable? Or are you really a follower of Jesus? Because rest assured, the winning is coming. The gain is on the way. The victory is ours. We win in the end. Friends, it's not about what you gain. It's about who you follow. Are you following Jesus? And I, I saw this on Twitter earlier this week. And I really thought it was fascinating. I'm not going to say it verbatim because I'll probably mess it up. But essentially, it went like this. If I have heaven and if I have the streets of gold and I have all the comforts and no sickness and no disease and no illness, if I've got the feast if I've got the stuff, but Jesus isn't there, do I really want heaven? And guys, Jesus is the greatest prize. 
to know him and to love him, to experience him. The thing is, is when we lose, we're not really losing. When we walk away from stuff, we're not really walking away from stuff. We're actually walking towards Jesus. We're moving towards something even greater. And there are people watching right now where you've either been playing church, maybe you've just been a bandwagon fan, you called yourself a Christian, but you never really were. And you know who God is, but you've not really been following him. Or, 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 or there's people who've never invited Jesus, the greatest gift into their life. This is your moment right now. And I wanna invite you, don't just be a bandwagon fan, be a follower. How do we follow? I laid it out for you, but it starts with us just acknowledging our sin and our need for him. And I want to invite you to do that. Would you pray with me right now? Would you say, Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I don't know it all, but I believe that you came to die and were raised. And I want to know you and forgive me of my sin. I acknowledge you that you are Lord. Be the leader of my life. I choose not just to be a fan, but to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, we believe that you are saved and your life is about ready to transform forever. If you prayed that, would you click the button down below if you're watching on our online platform and follow the prompts. If you're on Facebook or YouTube or somewhere else, throw up a hand emoji or send us an email that says amen at theblockchurch.org. We want to walk this journey with you. I'm so proud of you. I love you, church. Let's follow Jesus with everything we have. God bless you.